Beloved of God, welcome to another exciting edition of Thursdays at the Table, the place where we sit down and get to some of the deepest things that we know. I am so honored today that Father Gregory Joseph Boyle, an American Catholic priest of the Jesuit order, is with us today. He is the founder and director of Homeboy Industries, the world's largest gang intervention and rehabilitation program, and the former pastor of Dolores Mission Church in Los Angeles, California. Father Boyle has won numerous awards, including the Civic Medal of Honor from the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce, the California Peace Prize granted by the California Wellness Foundation, one that I find very interesting. He was named the 2007 Humanitarian of the Year by Bon Appetit magazine, and he was inducted into the California Hall of Fame in December of 2011. His published works include Tattoos on the Heart, The Power of Boundless Compassion, Barking to the Choir, the Power of Radical Kinship, and his most recent publication, The Whole Language, The Power of Extravagant Tenderness. Father Boyle, welcome to Thursdays at the Table. Happy and honored to be with you. Well, thank you so much. The honor is truly mine. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the uh, initials SJ, Help orient us to what that means uh, in terms of, of uh, the way that, that you are situated in Catholicism. Uh, well, I'm a Jesuit, and so SJ stands for Society of Jesus, or St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder, called it La Compañía de Jesús. And so, you know, in the 1540s, somewhere in there, uh, was born this uh, troop of uh, men who wanted to reimagine a way of living as though the truth were true and stay close to the marrow of the gospel. So, um, and it was a reaction to kind of a lot of what was going on in the church, as were the Franciscans and the Dominicans, and then so to the Jesuits, uh, which is now the largest uh, religious order in the Roman Catholic Church. Indeed, thank you. You know, uh, you are a, among several of those that I revere and and follow uh, in Catholicism. Father Richard Rohr is another, and I'm drawn to the wisdom, but also the authenticity of the witness uh, that that both of you exhibit and offer to the world. So thank you for that. Sure. When did you know that you were called into intentional set apart ministry? Well, I was educated by the Jesuits, so I knew them. Uh, my uncle was a Jesuit. Uh, you know, we always had Jesuits over for dinner at my at my parents' house and when I was growing up at my grandparents' house. So it was kind of part of the air we breathed. And I always found them quite prophetic and fearless and hilarious and joyful. <laughs> so the combination of all those things was really attractive to me. So it was kind of like, I'll have what they're having. And <laughs> so, um, and so, you know, he, that was 51 years ago. So um, that I entered the Jesuits. So, but, you know, since you stay, you, you start to discover and rediscover kind of charisms and um, ways of proceeding that the Jesuits kind of embrace that that to this day, I still uh, find myself thrilled by. And so your story is similar to exactly what we're trying to demonstrate through Thursdays at the Table, that some of the most uh, transformative and informing conversations that we have are those that take place at our kitchen table. And that's, again, where it sounds like you were introduced. I love the way that you talk about there was joy, there was laughter. Folks don't always think about uh, those who are in ministry as being full of laughter and joy, but it sounds like those at your dinner table exhibited that or exuded that. Yeah, I think part of the, you know, the measure of a true and authentic discipleship in general is fearlessness and joy. Mm. And and the counter position to that, of course, is sadness and 
and fear. Right. And right. and so those those are things you can always uh, sniff out. You know, you go, who, who's leading us? You know, are they right. are they fearless? Are right. they joyful? And then that just means that they they have been able to connect uh, to the deepest part of of what our God of love is calling us to do and to be in the world. And, and that will always issue in in fearlessness and joy. So, you know, so if we're trembling and mm. and we're behind locked doors, as the disciples were at yes. that moment, when Jesus somehow gets into the room, you know, and it's funny how much that, you know, we over the years have disparaged Thomas because he doubted, but the truth yes. is he wasn't in that room. You know, he, uh, that's why I always liked him because he, he wasn't, he was out in the world yes, and he wasn't trembling and he knew as much as everybody else knew and he wasn't frightened. He, I'm going to presume was out in the world engaged. Uh, that's why he, he missed out on Jesus showing up that, that first time. So, uh, you know, for me, it's always been a, a kind of a way to check in and, and to see, um, you know, if, if, if there's authenticity in how you move in kinship in the world. Right. Um, and those are two ways that I think are telling. I love that. And, and I, one of the things I lament is that in the canonical books of the Bible uh, that we have, we don't get to experience the fullness of who Christ was, right? I, I refuse to believe that Christ was somber and as, as you, you know, always so serious. I just refuse to believe that we get a hint of it. If you read some of the non-canonical books, right? Um, but but I wish that we had a fuller understanding of how Christ was in, in more of his experience of a human being. Perhaps it would give us more freedom to feel like in church, in worship, as people of faith, we didn't always have to be so serious. Yeah, I mean, and there, there are more layers to that even. I think that's such a good point because it's about being fully human and it's about being playful and right. it's about um, laughing. And it's about delighting mm. and all these things that otherwise we've, we've been sort of saddled with and stuck with this notion that the harder thing is the better thing. Well, no, yes. the harder thing is just the harder thing. And so <laughs> we think it has to be, you know, um, exhaustive and exhausting and, yeah. and arduous and, and difficult and, and and yet it's all about joy really it's yes. it's not occasional joy it's really all about joy so how do you acknowledge the beloved who's in every moment and and recognizing that we're only saved in the present moment anyway so you might as mm. well be anchored there delighting in the person who's in front of you so i i i agree with you i think there's a kind of a richer fullness that that hasn't been really afforded us by by the tradition and how over the years we've we we just think Jesus is kind of sour sometimes right and right and more serious than we are you know? right so th there's a phrase that we started using a couple of years ago MMFA make ministry fun again and this reminds me of that you know we, we we're just going to have to take that back we're going to have to take that aspect that I know we can be confident uh, that was a part of who Christ was we're going to just take that back and live into it more in ministry your yes. first assignment carried you abroad um how did that Tell us where you were and tell us how that informed and shaped your ministry and then who you became as you continued to live out this sacred life. Yeah, I, you know, I was ordained in 1984. I, I'm not sure it, I would call it my first assignment, but okay. But before I came back to, I needed to do another year of theology. So I asked, you know, could I just go and take a break from studies and then kind of immerse myself in the Spanish speaking place. So I, I went to Bolivia. I knew some Spanish, but not enough to really do ministry. And But then I ended up, uh, you know, attaching myself to these two 
communities that hadn't had a priest in many, many years. And so, and this was in Cochabamba, Bolivia, and in the hills with the Quechua Indians. Mm. And, and so it just turned my life inside out. I just started to, in those days, Bolivia was the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. more poor than Haiti. And so there was something about walking with folks in in such a dire situation, and yet they were able to uh, always honor a sense of profound community and we're in this together. And, mm -hmm. and people were all kind of lock ar locked armed. And I, I found it kind of exhilarating. It, it not in a way that romanticizes uh, people's poverty, but it's... Uh, right. But it was a way of their faith, their dedication to each other, their kindness in the face of just the most arduous kind of living. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, it, it turned me inside out enough that I was supposed to go to Santa Clara University to be kind of the campus minister. And so I begged my provincial, my superior, mm -hmm. please don't send me there. Send me to the poorest place we have where I could mm. use Spanish, and that was Dolores' mission. All right, all right. I love that. How did that then, you say it turned you inside out. What perspective, if any, did it give you on the way that faith was being lived out in the United States? Well, it's, it's odd, you know, when you go to a third world country, and then you're propelled back to a first world, world country, Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, you know, it, it creates something that's quite dispiriting. You know, you you have kind of uh, something near an abhorrence for how we live and, you know, mm -hmm. in the first world. And so it's kind of, uh, at least initially, that's how you, you kind of feel. You feel like this. There's something kind of wrong in this hyper consumer as a consumeristic modality. So, um, but anyway, I, I mean, you pretty soon you, you kind of, you know, just want to roll up your sleeves and, and walk with, uh, with the folks on the margins and the easily despised and the demonized and the disposable, you want to kind of uh, stand at the margins so that they get erased. Mm -hmm. And, and then that's, then that's enough rather than shaking your fist and denouncing all sorts of other things. You just want to simply walk with people, which in the end is, uh, you know, is more compelling and actually more productive. Right. Absolutely. When you were talking about, again, that turning you inside out and you said, please don't send me there, send me to the people on the margins. You made me think about the song by Gregory Porter, take me to the alley. Um, take me to the afflicted ones, right? And that, yeah. that in, in fact, that is where we are far more likely to encounter Christ than in some of our beautiful, ornate, stained glass worship centers, uh, places of worship. Um, you took me right to that song. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it or not. No, but I, I will be now. Please, please, you must listen to it. It, yeah. it is really phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And so again, in this Dolores. And am I pronouncing that right? Dolores mission? Yeah. Okay. This is where the uh, ministry that I think you are now world renowned for homeboys ministry began. But what may, it, it makes me think about, there's that phrase, not in my backyard, a term associated with those who don't want programs geared toward the marginalized in their community, even if they espouse, right? Being a follower of Christ. But from what I've read about how Dolores' mission was situated, the gang activity was literally already in your backyard. Did you incur any opposition when you discerned that you needed to be in ministry with these individuals that were involved in the gangs? Well, again, I, I was pastor of the poorest parish in the cities from 86 to 92. And, and you know, the first two years of being pastor there, the issues were all around immigration. And so there were so many undocumented in my parish. And so we had family separation. We had uh, INS uh, raids of yeah. where people worked. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you had the Immigration Reform and Control Act, you had amnesty. So you had a lot of immigration related things. And then in 82, I mean, excuse me, in 88, I was two years in. That's when I buried my first young person killed because of gang violence. And it was almost mm -hmm. overnight that the gang re reality became so intense. So it was the beginning of the decade of death, 88 to 98. And 92 was the highest moment of gang-related homicides. So I was burying eight parishioners at one point in a three-week period who had been gunned down you know, gang members who had been gunned down. And in those days, gang members, well, we had eight gangs at war with each other, mm -hmm. just in this tiny geographic area, which was my parish, these two housing projects. So the LAPD called my parish the highest, the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in all of Los Angeles. So, you know, there was not much, I don't, again, it wasn't so much a choosing to, I think I'll work with gang members. It was mainly a response, you know, from a parish, you know, do we ignore this? Do we just have church on Sunday? Or or again, do we roll up our sleeves as opposed to burying our heads? So, um, and that's what we did. And we started a school and we started a jobs program. And then we started social enterprises. And then we were off and running. And beyond the time that I was pastor, you know, mm -hmm. homeboy born uh, in 88, and now we're 35 years at it. Right. So you say that it wasn't a matter of should we work with gangs? It was um, not ignoring what was going on right there, again, literally at your front and back door. But you must be aware of how many congregations absolutely do ignore what's going on in their community and sort of have this, you know, many pe persons drive in to worship and then drive out again. And so what's actually taking place around the house of worship may or may not be a part of their everyday lives. Uh, and so uh, you, you did something, it, it may not have felt so at the time, but it, it actually was profound and unique in, in the life of, of many um uh, faith communities. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I didn't answer the the first part of your question earlier, which is opposition. So we've been right. around for thirty five years, but the first ten years were death threats, bomb threats, and hate mail, but ah. never from gang members. Okay, never because we were always a sign and symbol of an exit ramp and a sign of hope. Mm -hmm. Always gang members, but you know, we got these hate letters from law enforcement, mainly oddly, mm. you know, anonymous uh, LAPD or sheriffs. And they, they would just say, we hate you. You know, you're, you're part of the problem. You're, you're not part of the solution. It was kind of extraordinary. I mean, again, I grew up in LA um, in a kind of a privileged area where when the police arrived, you breathed a sigh of relief. They got the cat out of the tree. Right, but when I came to to Boyle Heights, wow, I I was kind of astounded at how law enforcement treated our people. In fact, naively, I went to the captain of our local station to say, "Hey, I'm not sure you know this, but they they're they're taking gang members to the factories behind the projects and they're beating them down mm. for purposes of intimidation or interrogation and charging them with nothing." Uh, you know, I th I thought maybe you might want to know that. Well, trust me, he didn't want to know that. I mean, then they ended up shooting the messenger. So that was all part of the air we were breathing in the very first 10 years. So I would write an op-ed piece about, you know, kids join gangs because it's about a lethal absence of hope. So let's infuse hope to right. kids for whom hope is foreign. Oh, I would get hate mail and, and death threats on our left on our answering machine. Hmm. And and that was solid for 10 years or so until our homeboy bakery burned to the ground. And uh, and then suddenly the LA Times had an op-ed piece or an editorial that said, hey, this place doesn't belong to Father Greg Boyle. It belongs to Los Angeles. 
Mm. So let's, and, and so they kind of got it in an instant. And, mm. and so the city of Los Angeles has been carrying homeboy industries on their shoulders since then. But the first 10 years were, um, you know, so it wasn't so much nimbyism as you were referring, right. because we were that community. I mean, this right. was where it was happening. And it was indigenous. You know, it wasn't nowadays. Gang members drive from, you know, Montebello to the to the barrio, right. to Boyle Heights. But they don't live in that community. But when I was pastor, they all all the gang members lived exactly in my parish. Mm. Now it's more of a commuter reality. <laughs> for for those who are involved in the gangs, that's interesting. But I want to I want to stop you for a moment, and I want to come back to something you said, because there are going to be some who hear this and say, "Oh, that cannot be true," that there were those employed by a law enforcement agency who were first of all crafting, sending hate mail to you, and then involved in the this kind of bullying, beating, um, criminal activity against those who were identified as gang members. Th th there's this tension in our society right now that when many look at our men and women in blue, they see nothing except individuals who are always of the highest ethical order, highest moral order. And if they do anything, it is only in response to, if they do anything outside of that, it is only in response to, to something that someone who's deemed a criminal has, has initiated. But you're telling me that this activity was done um, intentionally. Can you just unpack that a little more? Well, I, I do want to emphasize that that was 30 years ago. Of course, of course. And all pre-Rodney King. And, and and so it, that's not to say that things haven't changed. They have. Sure. You know, do I think an LAPD would take a gang member to the factories behind the projects now and beat them down? No, I don't, actually. Right. I don't think that would happen. Just because the culture has changed enough at least at the highest levels, mm -hmm. where there's no tolerance for that kind of thing. There, it, it wasn't, that wasn't the case 35, 30 years ago. Right. So it, it has changed, but it still hasn't changed enough because, mm. you know, there's a notion, like, for example, there's the, the guy who escaped the, the jail in Pennsylvania and was on the run. Right. Uh, somebody who had been convicted of murder was on the run for like 12 days. They mm -hmm. capture him, and the sheriff announces, our nightmare is finally over, and the good guys won. Mm. Well, you can draw a straight line from that statement, and absolutely everything we would like to change in law enforcement and, and all, the, all the things, the coloring outside the lines that happen. Right. Because if, if we think there's such a thing as good people and bad people mm. well then why are we surprised that that there are uh excessive uses of violence for example because right. after all they're just bad guys mm. or they've established themselves as bad guys because they ran they talked back they didn't fully cooperate right or you know i mean again I, I, for 40 years, I've walked with gang members, and I've never once met a bad person. Never. Mm. I've met wounded people, broken right. people, traumatized right. people, despondent people, deeply ill people. But I've right. never once met a bad person, and I've never met for sure an evil person. That's just, I've never met one. Mm -hmm. And I'm seven. So maybe, <laughs> you know, um, I've got a few more years and maybe I'll meet somebody. <laughs> but I never have, you know, and, right. and naming things correctly will really help us. You know, yes. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. But he saw the guy having seizures and thought he was possessed by a demon. 
He wasn't. He had epilepsy. And mm-hmm. and that doesn't change how I see Jesus, of course. Right. But it doesn't us to name things correctly. Mm. You know, Mike Pence last night on the on the debate said the answer to um, mass shootings is to expedite executions. Well, that's just, he just doesn't understand what it's about. It's about guns and mental illness. Okay, so you roll up your sleeves and you try to, you know, the day may come when we stop punishing wound and we Mm. seek to heal it. But the minute we decide to do that, watch what happens right we will right we will try to walk each other home to wellness none of us mm. are well until all of us until are well. all of us are well absolutely and and, in, and because these horrific things happen it's you know we're all unshakably good and we all belong to each other and there are no right. exceptions and so the so now we can really help people you know, who are really stuck in a despair or an illness that they never chose, that it chose them. Mm. And, then, you know, the byproduct of that effort will be fewer to none mass shootings. Right. Along right. with being sensible about guns. Right. Well, in in your phrasing and, and in, in what you just said, you take me right back to to the kitchen table that I grew up in. And my mother, she may not have phrased it just the way you did in terms of naming things correctly, but my mother would cringe and sometimes actually vocally respond when she heard people say, well, that child is bad. That's a bad child. And I mean, every time that happened, I could look at my mother and see a visceral reaction. Um, my mother had been an educator in the first part of, of, of her working life. And she, again, she just recoiled at anybody naming a child as bad. She said, "You, there are no bad children, but if you say that to someone enough, right, th- th- then they will begin to live into the way that you have identified them. So again, you take me right back to the kitchen table that I uh, grew up in or grew up sitting at rather. Um, that That's ex- right. But that was the thing I used to always hear. I mean, I had a probation officer say, don't even try with that guy, Louie. He, he's just pure evil. And you mm. just go, wow. Well, he ended up working for me. And every year we had a, a thing called the Homeboy Hero. And one, so that's for, we've been doing that for 25 years at our big dinner. Mm-hmm. And, and he was the Homeboy Hero one year and the father of, two beautiful autistic sons and he's so tender with them and you just go i don't know where people see that way you know where they see right. evil where there's only goodness there's always goodness you know people don't exactly see it and because you know complex trauma will keep you from seeing your unshakable goodness right until you can hold the mirror up and say here's who you are you're you're exactly what God had in mind when mm. God made you. And then you watch people become that truth and have it right. that truth. That's As exactly opposed right. to referring to is if you tell a kid he's bad enough, he'll start to believe that he is. Exactly. And live into it. I also love the fact that when you were talking about the individuals who lived in the community of the Dolores Mission, you said our people when you were talking again about the the way that uh, they were being treated by uh, some of the law enforcement, our people, that deep identity with those who were in the community, rather than seeing yourself as separate from, um, better than, over against, you identify as our people. What do you think that 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 does? What does that open up in terms of a relationship or potential for relationship? When you were asking me about Bolivia, and when I, it's been so many years, but when I look back, you know, you you have nothing to bring to them, especially when like your language is so, you know, elementary school level, right? Um, and yet, so then it's not about me bringing anything. 
I, I had a, a gang member in Houston after a talk I gave, and he was working with gang members now. And um, and he kind of pleaded with me. He said, how do you reach them, meaning gang members? Mm -hmm. and, and I found myself telling, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can, mm -hmm. can you be reached by them? Can wow. you allow your heart to be altered? So if you go to the margins to make a difference, then it's about you, and it can't be. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the margins to be made different by the people there, then it's about us, and it's exquisitely mutual. So I kind of learned that a long time ago. You know, um, I don't think I've ever transformed a life in my life. <laughs> but I, I know that transformation happens at Homeboy Industries for people, mm -hmm. that it's the whole place and the whole culture and the whole everybody giving a dose of kindness and tenderness. I know that has transformed people, right. and I know that my life has been changed. But see, that that feels passive, but it isn't. It's it's mm -hmm. the real deal. It's how you, you know, how do you um, allow your heart to be altered in such a way that everybody in in this mutuality, you, you, everybody inhabits their own dignity and nobility together. Right. It's not something as a white savior that I impose, impart, uh, that I give. I, I've never felt that. And I think Bolivia probably, you know, gave me, reminded me of how humility is so essential that it's, I'm not bringing anything to the table, but I'm going to go to the table and to receive what's on it. Speaking of kitchen table. Yes. And, you know, it, you're going to partake of it and you're going to recognize the table as sumptuous, that mm. this is plenty. You know, it's. I'm not going to go to the table and disparage what's on it. Here, let me bring some, bring a casserole I made. You know, you can do that as well. But it's it's sort of like you don't disparage the table, and you really don't fall in love with what you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm of receiving from what is on the table and from who's sitting around it right that is a profoundly christian thing you know and uh it's not about let's go convert people right you know but it's it, you're trying to be in the world who god is compassionate loving and kind and i think that's how you do it with great humility where you allow yourself to be made different by folks who are on the margins. Well, you, I don't, I don't know if you realize at the moment, a particular moment, a huge smile came over my face and I leaned in to, uh, to you because you touched on something that I was going to ask you about. Have you been accused of being this white savior who's coming in on a horse um, to uh, save uh, uh, those individuals, uh, most of whom I presume are people of color, uh, be because there's a lot of rejection of, of, of that kind of assistance, that kind of, again, uh, we're here to do something for you because, again, we're over against. But you touched on it yourself. You said, I'm not a white savior. You don't see yourself that way. And even the authenticity with which you speak, and again, this our language, we're in this together. I'm not doing transforming. I'm perhaps more transformed than any transformation I've ever made possible. I think you've already answered my question and how you have perhaps been able to overcome that accusation and just in living out your ministry and who you are as a follower of, of God through Jesus Christ, not embodying that white savior mentality. Yeah, no, I, I you know, I, I, I presume it's somewhere in there in people's thinking, although people are always, He's too polite to to raise that, I suppose. But I, I mean, you know, I was against white saviorism before it became a thing. A thing, and so I'm, I, I'm, I'm aware of it. But you know, um, and you know, there's it's kind of being in a darkened. I wrote about this once: being in a darkened room, and and somebody has a flashlight aimed at the light switch. 
<laughs> well, I, I will admit in my own kind of uh, near burnout early years, mm -hmm. I was trying to light switch on for gang members. Uh, but then you, re no, you, you can't do that. But you know, you, everybody owns a flashlight and everybody knows where to aim it. So then you have to be content with owning a flashlight and aiming it at the light switch mm -hmm. and people will turn the light switch or not. It's a little bit like having a child who's a, an addict, you know, you know, if a mother of an addict could check herself in to a rehab for her kid, trust me, she would. Mm -hmm. But that's not how it works. The kid actually has to go to the rehab. Right. What you can do is point to the door marked recovery and joy and life. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope, my child, I hope you walk to that door. But that's all you can do. And you may close other doors, say, mm -hmm. you know, you can't live here until you walk through that door marked recovery. That's clear and loving. So it's kind of like that, you know. Um, so you want people to inhabit the truth of who they are, where they discover their true selves and loving, where they know that loving is their home. And, and so they'll never be homesick if they know that. And so, so you want folks to learn uh, to to love and let love uh, be the only thing uh, that they embrace, you know, that they love being loving. And uh, when we say God is love or God is loving, we're not really saying how God is. We're right. saying where God is. God is in the loving. And and once you discover that, you know, then then that's when the transformation happens. Because everybody in, in a culture, in a community, or as the great John Lewis said, you know, we all live in the same house. Yes. It wasn't aspirational. It wasn't one day we might all live in the same house. It was a declarative statement. That's we all live in the is. same house. Right. And he didn't make distinctions. Some people live in the basement. No, we all live in the same house. So once you kind of establish, you know, especially the early Christian notion of this, mm -hmm. where it's sold of God. But in, and in our case, you know, a place that's safe, where people can feel seen, and then they can feel cherished. That's the transformation. That no one person, you know, is the agent of. It's it's the culture, it's, it's the community, it's this place of cherished belonging, where everybody feels united, and and we all move together in kinship. And so, it it doesn't allow for saviors, mm. white or otherwise. And yes, er, everybody obviously, which is a whole other issue in terms of our own society, that uh, all, all the folks who work at Homeboy Industries, you know, are uh, people of color mm -hmm. and all been to prison. And I'm heartened that 70% of our leadership, everybody who kind of runs the place, have come through the program now. Okay. So they have a kind of ownership. The only minority there are old white guys like me. <laughs> well, I, again, I love this image that you paint. Again, um, expounding upon John Lewis's um, statement that we all live in the same house. Would that, that is how all of us in, in faith communities really thought of it. I think back to uh, an episode that happened when I was in seminary. We were sitting in chapel and a homeless person walked in and walked up and sat on the front pew and people were repulsed. Um, and, and it was clear that the individual was really not welcome there. And I think that kind of thing plays itself out in all kinds of ways in our faith community. Why have we gotten so far away from this notion of all created in the image and likeness of God, all being in the same house? I feel like we need to go to sort of a spiritual rehab <laughs> to 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 reclaim this identity of of all being of one and one. 
That's, you're absolutely right. And, you know, so the early Christian community, they they would greet each other with a big old wet kiss. <laughs> and and part of the reason they did it was because you only did that to your blood relatives. Mm. And then they wanted to indicate and signal, no, everybody belongs. And so it was their way of, of taking seriously what Jesus took seriously, which are four things, inclusion, uh, nonviolence, mm -hmm. unconditional loving kindness, and compassionate acceptance. And so, you know, I, we, we need to return to this, I would say, to this mystical sense. We've, we've forgotten yeah. mysticism, and then we've yes. just become frightened and defensive and who's in and who's out and who will be saved and who won't be and and yikes what could be further from the god of love my friend mirabai star who i recommend she's a mystic and translates mystics yes. and she says um once you know the god of love you fire all the other gods and and it's important i think because i think firing gods other gods is mm -hmm. is sort of our task is how to keep ourselves you know close to the marrow of the gospel right and we lose sight of that you know it then the church becomes kind of the hall monitor mm. and slap the people and trying to keep people in line or so the tribalism that that's so pronounced in our country at the moment mm -hmm. you know i think the church needs to make amends you know, for the ways that it's contributed to, um, you know, to kind of uh, contributed to this great divide and division, and it's too bad. Right, right. Mirabai Starr, who is um, a contemporary, again, of Father Richard Rohr uh, that I mentioned at, at the beginning of our conversation and one of the um, participants in the Center for Action and Contemplation. Again, you wouldn't know this, but folks in this conference know, again, I adore <laughs> Father Richard Rohr and actually spend time uh, in New Mexico and at that center. So again, I, I very much appreciate Mirabai Star and all of our mystics. And I think you're right. That's something that we've left out of uh, our spirituality, we've left that out of of the um, education that, that that we offer uh, in our churches, and I think we're the poorer for it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Rich, uh, Carl Rahner, a theologian, used to say that Christians of the future will be mystics, or mm -hmm. they won't be Christian. And and I think he's absolutely right. I I really think it's. The more we can retrieve, uh, lately I've been kind of uh, immersed in in mystics and Jim Finley and turning to yes. the mystics. I recommend yes. recommend him. He's also part of uh, Richard Rohr and Mirabai Star uh, gang. Yes. So, um, Indeed, but it, it's really important, I think, because you you reach back and you find these people who were kind of at odds, and they were at odds with the church because, because they felt that the church wasn't anchored enough in love. Mm -hmm. And and that's sort of the whole point of the mystical quest. You know, it, our, the mystical quest is never, or, or even the moral, moral quest has never kept us moral. It's just kept us from each other. But the mystical quest is is something that, unifies us not just with the God of love, but with each other, which is God's dream come true. Absolutely. Absolutely. You talked, you, you talked about something else. You talked about this lethal absence of hope. I was hoping for a little while we could talk about how our faith communities could become integral in breaking down this recidivism rate that we see. Uh, individuals um, uh, find themselves in activity that perhaps gets them arrested, and then some go to jail, some go to prison. They come out, and there just seems to be this cycle, right, where before you know it, they're right back in. How do we break uh, this lethal absence of hope? What can those of us, again, who, who claim to want to follow the way 
of Jesus Christ. How can we be living in a way that, that, that helps to break this recidivism and speaks to this lethal absence of hope? Well, I, I think we disqualify ourselves so much. We, we just say, we think that there's no way that you can be beneficially present to somebody who's, you know, a returning citizen, for example. Mm -hmm. And yet if anybody who is the proud owner of a pulse can, can show up and hold the mirror up and return people to themselves and, and delight in people and pay attention and be astonished by the goodness and and then to reflect that back to them. So anybody can do that. And because anybody can do that, everybody should. And, you know, there's, a, a, you know, exciting movements out there. Like there's the one parish, one parishioner, a one a parish, a one prisoner. Mm -hmm. uh, has started in the Pacific Northwest. And it's a way of getting parishes to connect to folks who will be returned to their community you know, while they're locked up and, right. you know, communicating with them and then receiving them when they come out and, and welcome, welcoming them to the, to the community. And, and, and so there are lots of ways to do it. It has to do with intentionality, you know, mm -hmm. but there's, we're invited to the margins. And so those are very, you can identify, you know, the poor, the powerless, the voiceless, mm -hmm. the easily Spies, the readily left out, and how do we how do we invite parishes to stand with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop right. and stand with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. This, it, what this does, you know. For example, at Dolores Mission Church since 1987, every night, uh, undocumented homeless. Uh, and, and now, not so much always undocumented, but it was in the early days. Mm -hmm. But how sleep uh, in the church and thousands and thousands since 1987 have received resources and meals and a warm, safe place to sleep every night. Now, this is the poorest parish in Los Angeles that does this every night, right. seven, seven nights a week. And what it's done for the church, the parish, uh, is just, it's hard to uh, count it. it. It's just so powerful how it's its led parishioners to feel like, yeah, this is what it looks like to live as though the truth were true. And and so they, they feel, they never feel like there's some kind of disembodied church where people gather on Sundays. Mm -hmm. they This is exactly, you know, what the early Christian community experienced. And even though they're poor and they only speak Spanish and, and the parishioners, a great many of them are, you know, not formally educated. Right. They know that not with a sense of pride, still with a humble uh, sense that this is a privilege to serve these folks and to be beneficially present. Mm -hmm. They feel like, yeah, this is what it, this is what church should look like. Right. So again, coming back to the way that we name things, you began responding to my question with the phrase returning citizen. I've never heard anyone say it that way. I've heard folks say criminals recently released, parolee, those kinds of things, but returning citizen, what a different image that evokes just in hearing that phrase, returning citizen. And it reminds us that they are still citizens of this great nation and have a right uh, to, to life and life abundant. Um, is, that, is that a phrase that, that is used uh, commonly with those in the ministry of Homeboy? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's kind of out there now, you know, it's um, returning citizen. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a way, of, uh, you know, I, I don't know, citizens, sometimes I have a hard time with because sometimes people aren't citizens. <laughs> but right. return, 
returning community members mm-hmm. are returning to us. Right. And they've served their time. Yes. Paid their dues. And they should not be asked to pay any more of their dues because they've already paid it. Right. And so if people don't hire them or don't uh, rent apartments to them or don't allow them to vote, you know, but this is wrong. Right. And it, again, it's born from a, a, a and, and the church is responsible in a large part, you know, because we think prisons are where bad people go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and again, I, I think it's, uh, you know, the church sort of backed the sin horse many, many centuries ago. Right. And it's bad. They could have backed another horse, <laughs> you know, and, and so then it all becomes indictment instead of invitation. And I think Jesus was only about invitation. Right. He was always inviting people to life in fullness and abundance. Mm-hmm. My joy, your joy complete. We could have backed that horse. Mm. But the sin horse was it worked. It, it kept That's people right. afraid. Right. You know, God, if I don't go to heaven. Uh, I can't miss church on Sunday. I can't miss mass because uh, that's a mortal sin or whatever. This is maybe more Catholic than anything else. But again, did it work? Yes. It worked mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. It worked on me. Did right. it help? Not even a little bit. It didn't help even a little bit. And so the church could have embraced the thing that helped, but it didn't. It embraced the thing that worked. Right. And not everything that works helps, but mm. everything that helps works. Will ultimately and work. The more the church, people of faith and 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 worshiping communities, the more we invite people to joy right. rather than indict people, I, I think the better. You know, it's fuller. And it's why people don't go to church because they go, ah, eh, why? Right. You know, and, and and again, I think the mystical approach uh, has more fullness to it than the, the, the approach that just says, cut that out. Right. Right. You stop that. Just say no. Um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, you spoke to it a little bit. We won't, we won't, we won't go there. We won't deal with just say no. Um, <laughs> you spoke to it a little bit, but I wonder if you could be a bit more intentional. Um, so congregations that do want to have more of an outward facing ministry really do want to, to try and make a difference in their community, but they're, they're genuinely afraid. They're genuinely afraid of that engagement. What would you say to them? Well, all fear is born from ignorance. And so you want to move with some intentionality beyond the ignorance. Mm-hmm. And but th- there are kind of two controlling principles at at Homeboy. One is everybody's unshakably good, no exceptions, mm-hmm. and we belong to each other, no exceptions. Once right. you embrace two profoundly Christian notions, then it propels you outside of yourself and your own congregation. You know, it allows you to you go. What am I afraid of? And and again. All harm, you know, is created by people who aren't well. Right. And so how do we do what Jesus did, which was nonstop healing? You know, Levi, the tax collector, you know, people were grumbling because he's eating with them. And all people see is sin. But Jesus only talks about health and illness and, 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 and getting well. Right. And that that's a signal to us, you know, that mm-hmm. that we need not be afraid of the bad guy because thank goodness there are no bad guys. Right. Uh, right. You know, and roll up our sleeves again and, and try to engage in the same healing as Jesus did, where we pay attention to people, we listen to people, and we cherish people. Right. And then suddenly you watch them inhabit their own goodness, which they didn't really believe was there. Right. 
Well, and you speak about that in Tattoos on the Heart, one of your books. You talk about Jesus says you are the light of the world. You say, I like even more what Jesus doesn't say. He does not say one day, if you are more perfect and try hard, you'll be the light. He doesn't say, if you play by the rules, cross your T's and dot your I's, then maybe you'll become light. No, he says straight out, you are the light. It is the truth of who you are waiting only for you to discover it. That's beautiful. That's profound. But he also doesn't say, hey, everybody, look at me. I am the light of the world. Mm. No, he doesn't say I am the light of the world. He says you are. Mm. That's also kind of important in terms of Jesus, not just ourselves, you know. Right. Jesus is, and so is God, is always deflecting. Yes. Is always, Why are you looking at me? Come on now. <laughs> right. That's right. Why do you call me good? There's only one that's good. That's exactly right. But that isn't how we teach Christ, though. You know, that really isn't how how we teach Christ. Um, And again, I, I think we've turned it on its head and we've confused who Christ is so much that our worship of Christ then uh, be, be, becomes contorted. And the way that we then, in our emulation, in our living out of Christ, is also, I think, contorted. You talk about no need to contort yourself to be anything other than you are, because you are already that light. Right. And then the Christ in me recognizes the Christ in you. And then you go out into the world and you can see Jesus and you can be Jesus. And and so that invitation gets simpler rather than more complex. Indeed, indeed. I had I had talked about this song, and I, I just want to leave it uh, leave us with these words again from Take Me to the Alley. Take me to the alley. Take me to the afflicted ones. Take me to the lonely ones that somehow lost their way. Let them hear me say, I am your friend. Come to my table, rest here in my garden. You will find a pardon. Thank you so much for the work you do, Father Boyle. I think that you are inviting people to the table where they know that they can find pardon, they can find the beauty of who they are, and you really are helping to transform our world. Thank you. Thank you. Privilege being with you.